Hi, I'm Ed Sperling. I'm the Editor-in-Chief of Semiconductor Engineering. I'm over at Synopsys with Srinivas Raghavendra. I'm going to talk today about challenges in ramping up new manufacturing processes. Srinivas, we've seen lots of new processes rolling out on a regular basis now. It used to be, you'd think about every couple of years you'd get a new process, but now you've got almost one a year and sometimes multiple versions out of every single one. What sort of impact is that having on design? Well, Ed, what I can tell you is that it's, it's, it's an interesting time with, with a lot of people initially thinking that process, con process development would be, would be complicated and therefore take longer. But what we are seeing is that the frequency with which new processes are coming out is actually shrinking. And that's not because processes are any easier to do it than before. As a matter of fact, they're a lot more complicated. Um, but what has happened is that the, the solutions that help processes you know, be brought up are becoming more and more sophisticated. So we, we can now more easily have, say for example, TCAD interact with you know, lithography, with OPC, uh, with, with circuit simulation, with design, and iterate more, more faster so that you can come up with a better solution sooner. And you're seeing the, the fruits of this in how quickly we can come up with new and advanced um, processes. Let's take a closer look. Sure. One of the challenges is that you used to have, it's not even just one process that is coming down the pike. It's now a process for a different foundry, right? So the, what sort of impact does that have? So let, let me begin by telling you, you know, how most people think about process development, and product development. So what most people are familiar with this, with this graph, you know, which is what we use to, um, to uh, show how product ramp happens. So this is what you would call product ramp. And excuse my poor writing, but it's product ramp. And what you're doing here is, this is, this is the time axis. You're, you're as, as time goes by, your yield is improving. And you know, sort of asymptotically gets to this point uh, where you're happy enough with your yield. This, this, is, this is a graph that most people are comfortable with. They understand that. But process ramp occurs well before this, as you can imagine. And well before the first wafer is, is run in the fab, you know, you start with time minus, this is time zero, you're starting somewhere here, and you start, first of all, with the TCAD process, right? And here, when, when you're talking about TCAD, talking about transistor architecture, talking about your interconnect stack, talking about materials, you're talking about your IV curves for your transistors and so on. So this really is where T equals zero, really, if you think about a new, a new process, okay? This is where you start with. And as you are beginning to, to become more comfortable with your choice of transistors and interconnect and so on, you begin to think about your patterning. You know, this we, we call this OPC, this is called this patterning, Litho patterning. Okay. And here, so with, with, with OPC patterning litho, what we are trying to understand is how, what kind of patterns can you print? Right? This, this is, of course, the most fundamental thing. Can you print what you design? And this is the research you're doing or the development you're doing about patterning. And remember that you know, closely ties to TCAD because here you're saying, what's my interconnect? what's my transistor architecture and so forth. And here you're saying, what do I come up with? Can I print it? Right. And here you're also making the, here you're making the choices such as, do I need multi-patterning? Do I need EUV? Right? Do I need immersion lithography? So these are weighty problems that you have to solve because that in turn impacts you know, what you do when you go into production. So think of these as STCAD and OPC as the first two things you have to do to get your process development going. Well, as this is maturing, then of course, you know, we have to ask ourselves, what kind of designs do we plan to manufacture? And, and you bring that insight into this mix of TCAD and OPC, and then this mix is what you begin to call BTCO, right? This is design, technology, co-optimization. This is design, this is technology, we've been co-optimized. And we're doing that 
you're iterating. Obviously, you will not get this right the first time. So you're iterating. Pardon me again, my bad graph. Just, but you're, you're iterating here. And so when you've done enough of these iterations, but these are quick. So you have to be a question about how is it that we're getting the processes out on time? Because we can do this virtually, right? At this point, you're not yet necessarily you know, running wafers. You're not committing yourself uh, to if you want me to move along. So, so we, we, we're done yet. When we finish iterating, you know, we can do this rapidly because it's virtual. We're, we're done. And that's when we move into the actual manufacturing step. It's gotten more complicated than that, though, right? Because now it's DTCO has given way to system technology co optimization. You now have to think about this in the context of everything else that goes with it. Indeed. Indeed. Yeah. So, the, from DTCO, you know, there's this thing about STCO. But, you know, that, that is where you're bringing system constraints into the picture, including, you know, what kind of software you run and so on. But for the purpose of this conversation, you know, I want to talk about how we go from creating this process and then ramping it into production. Okay. So here, I'm going to switch colors and say this, you know, you start with, with um, the beginning of your process. You start with the, with the process that you designed here. And you then ramp your process to the point where you can get into production. So what you're doing here on, on, on this curve is you are, you are reducing your defect density. So when we start off here, obviously, your defect density will be very, very high. But you just, you just got the basics of it working. And the trick is to reduce your defect density to the point where the first, you know, wafer can be run with some kind of loop. And you have to do this in conjunction with whatever foundry is working with this too, right? Because this is no longer just Synopsys is going to be designing a, a tool for a process. It's now these tools have to work with every different flavor of this process. Oh, absolutely. I, I, should, I, should, I should emphasize all of this is done by the fabs. But this work we're talking about happens in, in, the, in the fab. This work we're talking about happens in the fabs. So the fabs do their own, you know, how should I say, twist to these things. But in general, this is the principles they follow. Does that make sense? Okay. So here now what we're doing is, you know, working on improving the process so that it becomes more stable, so it becomes, it yields better. And when you, be, when you begin this, so let, let me also briefly catch you up on what kinds of tools are used in this case. Here we talk about TCAT tools, here are the OPC patterning tools, here for the design your PPAC coming in from here. But when you get into here, you know, what you need are process control and analytics tools. So what are these? Okay. Does it help that the designs that are being done today are being split into different chips, chiplets, whatever it happens to be? Because in the past, you tried to put everything onto one single SOC and cram all that together your defect density had to be significantly higher because of that, right? Well, it, it certainly helps if the, if the silicon dye is small, right? Because of the defect density, there's, there's definitely that. But, you know, compounding the problem, though, on the other hand, is that now you're bringing together silicon from different, different nodes, right? And then you also have the challenge of stacking them together, making sure that that does not get use a, a different kind of problem. So, yes, it, it does become slightly simpler on the one, on the one axis, but it becomes a lot more complicated on that axis. Not least of all is you know, how do you split up this bigger SOC into smaller dyes? You know, what goes into what, into what dye and so forth? Do we have any indication at, at this point how these designs are going to age? Because as you start getting into more advanced nodes, you have many more uh, things that you have to worry about. Well, there, there, is, there is a whole uh, you know, discipline of silicon life management, right? Where you talk about reliability and so on, which I think actually is, is after you tape out, right? In the sense that that's when you, that's when you watch out what's going on. But during your production, you put in monitors to, uh, to see what's going on. But again, I see that as a different discipline, the one of product ramp versus, you know, what I'm trying to focus on, which is more of a process ramp, okay? So on, 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 again, I'm talking about process ramp. You know, I wanted to tell you more about the tools that you use for process control and analytics. So what's the big challenge there? The challenge here 
is that in a modern fab, um, the, the Giegel fabs you might have heard of, there is multiple axes of complexity. One, on the one hand, there's just a lot more equipment because a lot more steps involved. And each of the pieces of equipment now have a, has a lot more information that's sending out to its operators you know, through sensors, right? And then, and then you're doing all this, you know, with, with, a, with a mix of devices coming through, which has three different of, you know, axes of complexity, which makes for a, a very large amount of data that you have to process as an engineer. We, we, have, we have customers who are emitting petabytes of data, petabytes of data here because of, of all of this complexity going on here. And what you need here with process control and analytics is tools uh, or solutions that help you understand what your process is doing and how you can, how you can improve it. And, and the important thing I want to say here is this um, data explosion is, 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 is causing us to have to rethink how these tools are built. Some of that has to do with machine learning too, right? Because that's, that's starting to creep into almost everything here. Absolutely, machine machine learning is is is, is uh, you, know, you know very important when talking about this kind of this kind of uh, data volume. But I see that as hub of the stack. We can think of this as a stack where you know you, you need at the, the very at the very low the very basic you need just good engineering to be able to deal with this kind of data. You now above that you need a layer where you can bring together the information you're getting from equipment. And, and marry that to information you're getting from, from patterning, from OPC. Marry that to the information you're getting from TCAT, information you're getting from design. So that when you see an excursion on, on, your, on your production line, you can think about it. Is this a nuisance problem? Is it a real problem? And that's only possible if you can bring together all of this disparate informa information into one you know, stack where this can be all accounted for. Now, your idea of machine learning is, 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 is a perfect one, but that sits on top of that. So this gets incredibly complicated. What comes in here that changes this? How do you now deal with all this complexity and all the, the constraints that you have to deal with in the new processes? It's, 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 it's a great, great way to think about it. Um, I like to um, introduce the concept of a data continuum. The idea is that you want to bring data from the very beginning of your design cycle all the way to production and be able to analyze and reason about the data. That data continuum is what will help you move from reactive process control to predictive process control. With the, the, the old days of, of waiting for a problem to occur and then bug, debugging it is not what you want in a, in a giga fab with, with so much at stake. So predictive process control is where you're changing the paradigm to, to be, you know, proactively listening to signals that tell you what's going on with your equipment, what's going on with your, with your you know, um, uh, parametric yield, what's going on with your functional yield, and using that as a way of proactively uh, you know, getting in front of a problem and, and, and sort of resolving it. Really what you're doing is shifting everything left in, the, in now the manufacturing side, right? It is, it, is a, it is a shift of paradigm indeed, absolutely. That's exactly right. And you know, we are well situated to do that, given the wealth of, of, of technology and, and, and expertise we have here, this it fits nicely. You know, when you shift this left, where is it going? It's going into technology development. It's going into design, and there is that intersection coming along now, which you know, which we can serve very well. And that also moves the EDA world much tighter with the manufacturing side, right? It does indeed. That, that's one of the nicer things we're excited about. You know, EDA has always been an enabler for manufacturing. But now it's becoming more than that. It's becoming a partner. We're, we're going in and, 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 you know, our historical strength, that, that is, you know, in the EDA is algorithms, is, is data management. And this is algorithms and data management on steroids, so to speak. Right? It's just a huge amount of data which we really know how to deal with. So we're bringing in our, our expertise and our know-how that we've honed over decades to now, you know, bringing new paradigms of how we can improve process control process RAM, and in turn, make your product RAM faster and more effective. 
you've got a few concentric circles going on here too. If you think about sort of a Venn, Venn diagram, you've got the design side, which is now expanding into the manufacturing side. You've got the manufacturing, which is being pushed left into the design side, but you also have both of them reaching out to the right because now it's in the field and you have to get that data loop back in. How does that all go together? Well, the, the word that comes to mind is fusion, right? In, in the sense that it, it is, it is. these are, of course, different disciplines, and these are very complex disciplines on their own. But at, at, at their peripheries, they are fusing together. You know, a little while ago, there was a talk of DFM as being the, as the way to do this, which is where you, where you make your design more manufacturing friendly. When we talk about MFD, manufacturing for design, I think neither of those really captures what needs to happen, which is that needs, there needs to be a fusion of these, of, these, of these disciplines in a way that the boundaries are, are not completely erased, but become more porous. And my expertise goes back and forth. You know, we, we, bring ex we bring knowledge about manufacturing challenges to design in a way that design can do something about it. And we certainly can bring information about design, OPC and TCAD into manufacturing so that we know as manufacturing proceeds where the challenges are and how to mitigate them. We've been hearing more rumblings about curvilinear patterning as well. What impact does that have? Oh, that, that's, that's a wonderful question. So that, that fits in here. Right, when we talk about OPC patterning, so curvilinear is a way that you remove the constraints of everything being Manhattan, like in 90 degrees. And that, that constraint made manufacturing unnecessarily complicated. You know, things, you know, if something has to be a perfect T, that's a lot more work. And there's no reason most of the time for it to be. You know, it's okay for it to be curved, and it's still mostly you know, meets its needs. As a matter of fact, not only is it easier to manufacture, it actually actually gives you better you know, process window. And that's actually a very helpful thing, you know, that's enabled by some of the new things we are doing in, in OPC, but it, it's absolutely a good thing for, for, for the future. Sir Vendra, thanks for a great explanation. Thank you very much, Ed. It was a pleasure. Thank you.